Well, good evening. We, oh, no, 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 no. We'll try it one more time. Well, good evening. Good evening. All right, all right. Hey, we have a great panel tonight of some just incredible leaders. I just want to talk for a moment about where we are right now and how good it feels to be here. Our country is so divided on so many things. But on the issue of lead poisoning, it's an opportunity, as we heard from Mike, Mike Pence's Deputy Health Secretary just a few, a few minutes ago. It's a, it's a moment for us to come together just around common sense and our kids. And sometimes it's hard for us to think of the children in our country, all of them out as our kids, but I would encourage us to do just that. And let me tell you what it looks like sometimes when, when, when we struggle to get past all those adjectives that we put in front of our kids before we just say child in this country. I was in South Central LA, it was about it was the 10th anniversary, actually, of, of the riots or the uprisings after Rodney King. Uh, the cops who beat him were set free. And Jack Kemp was on stage. Now, that part of Los Angeles had burned. It was being rebranded as South LA. And folks who were concerned about the future of the children in that community had come together across party lines. And Jack, Jack Kemp was on stage. And, so I mean, our kids, our kids, our kids. He was clearly talking about the kids of that neighborhood. Our kids, talking about health and the economy and education, what needed to change for them to live great lives unencumbered by sorts of obstacles that confronted so many South Central LA. And standing next to me in the wings was an older black woman who had clearly lived most, if not all, of her life in South Central. She was the way that she was received, just moving through the crowd, it was clear that many people knew her, felt loved by her, and felt a debt to her. And she leaned over to me and she said, our kids, where's he from? And I said, man, I think he's from Buffalo. I know it's upstate New York. She said, huh, whose kids is he talking about? As if nothing in her life had prepared her to hear a white Republican from upstate New York refer to the children of South Central as our kids. And I looked at her and I just said, ma'am, I get your point. I think his point is that they are all American children and we are all, uh, and we are all uh, Americans and Therefore, they're all our kids. And she said, okay, I'll try that. When we're talking about lead poison, we're talking about our kids. We're talking about rural kids. We're talking about urban kids. We're talking about black kids. We're talking about white kids, brown kids, Native American kids. And right now, I think we should be hopeful because as we look at this administration, as we look at this Congress, as we look at state houses across this country, this is an issue we can put forward, push forward. But we have to go into this with the fervor of parents and grown-ups who are in this for all our kids. With the impatience that has been stored up over the decades of fighting on this issue. We were just hearing about East Chicago. I can remember being a young organizer working in East Chicago. We had a team there. I was a, their regional supervisor. I came in to visit them. The high school had just been built. It's about 20 years ago. The grass was not growing at the high school because the land was so poisoned. West Baltimore, you talk to, to Ruth Ann, there are families we're still finding who live in houses where they have multi-generational impact from lead. And so let us come together across all kinds of lines. Let us come together and learn from each other this, these days together. But most important, let us Go home with the urgency and the righteousness of people who know that our, count, that our country, our counties, our cities can, our states can and must do better right now. And with that, I am pleased to turn to this panel that includes an inspired governor, inspired city health director, one of the most powerful in the country, and two great advocates. And so I'm going to start with you, Governor Ehrlich, and if you could please just say a few words about what's on your mind tonight on this issue and we'll work our way down the panel. 
Well, I'm happy the Ravens won today. That's <laughs> 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 Let me share. Now, thank you. I got one. one. Um, <laughs> two, two, two. All right. I want to offend any Redskins here. Uh, it's Governor of Maryland, you got to watch that stuff, as you know. Man, so. uh, just a couple thoughts. Uh, there's, let me divide my, my two thoughts. My first is with regard to records of governors or mayors or, or presidents, for that matter. It, it's, you have your traditional tools, obviously, your public policy tools, your bully pulpit tools, and, and at the end of four years or two years or eight years, whatever, you have, you have your record, and, and, and that's it. Um, and you can utilize those tools uh, as you deem appropriate, but sort of leadership 101 is, in my view, in all the leadership books, everybody's got a leadership book out there, but if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And as incoming administration, I've been there in the past, uh, a lot of people are yelling at you, a lot of people are sending you position papers, and right now in my life, a lot of people are sending me position papers to get to the transition and and the president-elect and all that. but So a lot of people are yelling, there's a lot of noise, a lot of really important issues, and of course, everyone in this room, for everyone in this room, this is a very important issue, it is the issue. And Cystic Fibrosis Foundation next door, if they were here, their issue would be very important. And, and, and so, when everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. It's Leadership 101, and, and, and now is the time to make your issue, uh, to, to stand out. And that's not just screaming, that's using the substance to, to make your case. Uh, I sound like a Republican here, sorry. Uh, but uh, every, every interest group that came to me as a member of Congress, member of the state legislature, or governor of Maryland, this term investment, it's overused in politics, it drives me crazy. We need more investment, we need more investment. And, and, and the, the bottom line of investment is, it sounds good when you say it real fast, but can you make your case? Can you quantify your case? Can you show X amount of dollars up front equals X plus down the road? Prove it. Ruth Ann, prove that to me coming in. Not everybody can do it. Just because it sounds real good when you say it real fast doesn't mean you're going to get the dollars. And, and particularly in this era of, of limited resources in many cases, subdivisions, states, uh, you have to make your case. Uh, Again, Leadership 101, with regard to leadership, it really helps when you have a Ruth Ann. Where is she? I'm scared of her. She reminds me of my mother. <laughs> All of us up here are scared of her. That's why we're here. Yeah, that's why we're here, exactly, on a Sunday night. Um, when you have someone with that much credibility, in all seriousness, that person uh, stands out from the crowd. Not everybody enjoys that kind of credibility. Not everybody enjoys that credibility with their senior staff. To the extent you have that kind of person in the community who can quantify that issue and show you on paper, I need X to get X plus, it's really helpful. Uh, my fourth observation, I only have five, is, is uh, particularly, and this may be very appropriate in this day and age, or at least right now, uh, criminal justice reform was one of my big issues and we were doing it in Maryland before it was cool. And a lot of the feedback to me was, well, you can't be doing that. You're a Republican, come on. And, and so we, we, in many cases, in politics, particularly given the 24-7 nature of, of cable talk radio and blogs and whole nine yards, we have these predispositions. The liberal Democrat, conservative Republican, you can't cross lines. We, you know this so well, so, so well. And so, with Donald Trump, this is a very non-traditional person. I'm not, not going on a limb here. Most of his life is a Democrat. Very unpredictable in many cases, but he knows real estate. He knows business. Quietly, he's been very philanthropic in many respects. I've known him for, for many years. This is a decent opportunity, a pretty good opportunity, in my view, my humble opinion, for the folks in this room to make a big time case to the incoming administration. Because I believe he's going to understand and does understand, the people around him understand, you've already heard tonight, a very serious person understand the importance of this issue right now. Uh, and I guess my fifth observation was what? I'm getting old here. Um,
Um, yeah, just that sort of, because of the population we're dealing with, it, it's compelling. But again, uh, falling into traps, just because you think you have a compelling case, again, everybody competing for those dollars has a compelling case. And, and now's the time in transition to, to really stand out from the crowd, which is why we're here. I congratulate all, many of you, many of you have really been leaders in this area over, over many years. But now's the time to step up in a very respectful way and make the case. And when you're making your case, it's not an emotional case, it's an objective case with regard to numbers and futures. And when you get to all, get beyond all those numerators, the denominator is a moral justice. Thanks for having me. together one of Wes Moore's early comments about if you're not serious about your issue, and my issue is about affordable housing, you want to be serious, serious about it, you need to know about the impact of lead. Uh, the National Housing Trust owns and operates about 4,000 apartments up and down the East Coast and in the District of Columbia in Illinois, and we have an advocacy arm, which I'm going to mention tonight, and we also have a development arm, obviously. So let me try to knit together a couple of basic thoughts about how affordable housing and lead uh, come together in this country. There's a book I'd commend your attention to. It's called Evicted by a guy named Matt Desmond. And in Evicted, Matt Desmond spent about four years of his, of his uh, time in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and looked at what happened to people who had to go move together uh, because they were evicted. And what, frequency of moves led to. He didn't really talk about lead, but what he did talk about was the increasing burden of housing costs on people in this country. And my main first point to you is you can't deal with eliminating lead in the next five years unless we deal with it in the context of rental housing. Why rental housing? Because most people who are poor in this country are renters. We have a situation now where in the last generation, we doubled the number of renters who were paying more than 70% of their income for rent. 70% of their income, leaving very little available for health care, food, and so on. And it's not just a Baltimore problem or a Flint problem or a New York problem. Every state in this union, every state, has over one third of their rental households who are paying more than 30% of their income for rent and many have more than 50% uh, of their renters paying more than 30% of their income for rent. Well, why, how does that relate to lead? Well, guess where those people live? They live in older, substandard housing. Quite often, they live in older, substandard housing. We have about 44 million uh, rental-occupied housing units in this country. 44 million, give or take. About 23 million of those were built before 1980, so roughly half. About half of those are occupied by senior, senior citizens. So we're down to about 11 million units in this country. We don't know, but my guess is a fair number of those have some issue with lead. And so I uh, think it's important for the National Housing Trust to commit ourselves to being focused on the eradication of lead in older affordable housing in this country. Because we can't preserve it, we can't make it affordable if we don't make it healthy. And we do all kinds of things to make it healthy. We take, we put in formaldehyde-free cabinets, and we put in uh, 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 you know, low VOC paint or no VOC paint. We put in bamboo floors. And so I want to tell you about one family, the Martinez family. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., and uh, their, their situation and how we helped them. They, were, they lived over in an uh, area here called Mount Pleasant. And if you're not familiar with Mount Pleasant, Mount Pleasant is a rapidly gentrifying area. Um, it's an area where condos are now going for $1.5 million. 
uh, Martinez's landlord was uh, a slumlord, and he wanted to get rid of him in the worst way so he could redevelop it and turn it into luxury condos. But luckily in DC we have a right of what's called the first refusal, and they refused to move unless he would allow them to try to band up with their neighbors to buy the building. Sounds ridiculous, but they stayed there. He turned off all the lights in the property. They stayed there. He turned off part of the plumbing. They stayed there. We read about it at the trust uh, one day, that they got some press on it, and we came in and we banded together with them in a group called the Enterprise Foundation, and we bought that building. And we bought the building, lead paint and all. And when we went into the building, we had to put together all, do that all the windows, all the frames, all the radiators, all the window sashes, all the, the, floors, the shelves for the floors, and we did that because it was the right thing to do. Today that building received one of the first enterprise green certifications in the United States. Well, there's lots of buildings like that in the United States. And there's a lot of owners who don't have the funds to figure out a way to do this. And so as we go through this, my organization will be absolutely committed to working with everybody here to making sure owners do have the resources to do this because nothing's more fundamental than the kids' futures who live in our buildings. Nothing's more important. We've got to figure out a way to do that. So my, I would suggest to you that there's ways for all of us to work together. Uh, I'm here, and I like Wes's idea. You know, I'm here as an affordable housing advocate, but I'm here to eradicate wealth. opportunity to be here. I want to thank, first of all, Ruthann, who is one of my personal heroes and professional heroes, who also has this amazing ability to convene. I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I second what, what the governor said about, <laughs> about, her, um, about her ability to get all of us here, but I think she also is someone who really gets it. We heard Wes gave, um, giving such an amazing talk about what's happening on the ground in Baltimore, and I'll add one more statistic that came to light um, during everything that happened with Freddie Gray, which is that a child born today in Baltimore City, depending on what neighborhood they happen to be living in, can expect to live 20 years more or less than another child born at the same time. Now we're home in Baltimore to some of the best medical institutions in the world. Where people come from all over the world to get their treatment at Hopkins or University of Maryland and other places. So it's not just, it's not, that life expectancy difference cannot be attributed to health care. We have great care, and that's really important. I'm also an emergency physician, as, um, as you heard from, from one of our other colleagues earlier. It's great to have excellent care when you need it. But we have a situation where the currency of inequality becomes years of life. And it really is our responsibility to combat it. And I do think that an issue such as lead poisoning shows that issue of disparities, of distrust, of, um, of poor health, in as much light as any other. So I'll offer three observations, um, three ideas. I don't, I don't quite have the five that, that, that Governor Ehrlich has, but I'll, I'll offer you three ideas for approaches that we're taking. And then during our q and I'd love to hear more, more about whether you think these are the right approaches or not. The first is we say that a commitment to fiscal responsibility also means a commitment to public health. And here's what we mean. It's been said that Public health saved your life today. You just don't know it. And here's the reason. It's, you can put a picture, a story, there is a face of someone who was poisoned by lead. But what about the child who could have been poisoned by lead if not for the preventive measures that were taken to do lead abatement in their homes? Or what is the face of a child who could have gotten microcephaly from the Zika virus but as a result of preventive measures taken, do not get it. And so this is the constant battle that we have in health. I think that the, the governor made a very good point that we have to make the case for it. We have to talk about what are the cost savings that are incurred. But I would add that 
for all of us in public health, for all of us who want to make the case for these pretty difficult issues because the investment is seen years later. We have to not only talk about the cost of an intervention, we also have to talk about the cost of doing nothing. Second idea is, can we think about these problems differently? So in Baltimore, again, you heard um, very well from, from Ben, from Wes, um, what is happening in our city. You hear, you see the images of violence and, and crime, but what if instead of looking at people as the perpetrators of violence, we also understand the simple phrase that hurt people hurt people? that there is this cycle of violence and trauma that is our obligation to break. And what if we see issues like, we know that ch children who are poisoned by lead have decreased educational outcomes, and also potentially that could lead them to have even greater likelihood of being involved in violence and being involved in situations where there's violence later on. So can we also look at lead poisoning prevention as a violence prevention strategy? Is there a way for us to view these issues differently? Third, and finally, I want to give you an example of how something like this that seems insurmountable at times can actually be done. In Baltimore City in 2009, we had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. A black baby born in 2009 in Baltimore, just a few miles up the road, was five times more likely to die than a white baby. 2009. A lot of people said, well, infant mortality is very complicated. Social services, it's education, it's healthcare, it's health, it's housing, it's so many things. It can't be done. But the health department, together with our state partners, together with over 150 public and, it needs to be said, private partners, over 150 groups came together and said, we can do this. And within just seven years, we dropped the infant mortality rate in our city by 38% which is equivalent to 50 babies saved per year. And we also closed that gap between black and white infant mortality by over 50%. So I tell the story not because this issue is resolved, or even one child dying every year is one too many. <clears throat> but I wanna show that there are spotlights of success, there are stories of success that we also have to tell. Because as Wes reminded us, the statistics will help us to frame the issue, but we also have to tell these stories to show that when all of us act together, it is about a fight that is important. It is a fight that's not just about health, but also social justice. But it is something that can be done. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Alyssa with Moms Rising. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with our organization, we're a national organization on the ground and online of over a million members, and we work towards economic justice for moms, uh, women, and children. And we've been advocating on this issue um, for a while now, mostly because among the chief concern for mothers is the health and well-being of their children. And our moms were absolutely horrified when went to happen, and we saw an immediate outpouring. And I think because of that, we've been hearing moms speak out um, across the country in various communities coming forward and telling their stories. It, it kind of gets at the heart of it. If a mom can't give her baby a bath, if she can't give her toddler a glass of water without putting their health at risk, um, you know, everything else comes after that. That's at a core fear for a lot of our mothers. Um, you know, unlike a lot of the participants here, we aren't a direct so service organization. We're not lead or technical experts. Um, we're experts on telling the stories of moms and involving ourselves in our local and national communities on these issues. Um, we provide gateways for parents to advocate on behalf of themselves and their families, and we connect moms with key decision makers, the media, and other parents, um, because when they share their stories with other parents, they start to realize it's not an issue just in their household, it's a system-wide issue, and then they feel that they are able to go out and make a difference. Um, we do this through what we like to call layer cake organizing. It's delicious sounding, it's also fun. Um, and this is the way that we create many avenues for citizen engagement, and we open them um, so that moms who are busy people can choose what they have time to do at any given moment. 
in addition, when the many layers work together at the same time, that we find that they're most um, effective. And to illustrate what this means and kind of our organizing model, I'm gonna give some examples for the layers through our water justice work and the work that we've been doing on the Flint water crisis, but also around the country to kind of engage in not just lead issues, but also water availability um, issues. So the first layer um, is synergistic collaboration. At Moms Rising, we have over 200 local and national organizational partners. When we heard about the Flint water crisis, we immediately reached out to our partners on the ground in Michigan to find out how we could be most helpful. We're not about reinventing the wheel and we do not want to take credit for the amazing work and the people that have already been doing that work on the local level. Instead, we want to add value and voices where it's most needed at the time that it's most needed. In Flint and Detroit, we've been working with local moms, water activists and organizations like Mothering Justice, the Michigan League for Public Policy, Progress Michigan, We the People of Detroit, and the Bog Center. Nationally, we have collaborated closely with the American Academy for Pediatrics, the Coalition on Human Needs, and First Focus to fight for federal funding that will address the emergency situation in Flint and create preventative measures nationally. The second layer is one-click member advocacy. This is basically what you think of when you think of an organization with a .org in the name and the millions of emails you probably get every day from organizations like Moms Rising. Um, this involves sending letters, petitions, signing on to statements. Um, the difference with us is we always deliver the content that our members send, send in. So every petition that they generate that will end up um, in a governor's office or a member of Congress or with the president. Um, in terms of the Flint water crisis, we've collected over 60,000 signatures for moms and dads around the country calling on Congress and Michigan lawmakers to take action. In fact, we delivered a petition to Congress as recent as last Monday with signatures for moms and dads around the country. The third layer is member voice proxy. Our members often can't take a day off to lobby, so we invite them to create visual representations of their policy priorities so we can de deliver those as a proxy for their presence and invite the media to cover the delivery. And we try and make it as eye-catching as cute as possible because that will up the effect of getting the media. So for past campaigns, um, we've delivered giant thank you cards to governors, teddy bears to Congress to show that certain budget cuts were unbearable, and Valentine's Day cards decorated by kids to show which safety net programs they love the most. Number four layer is on the ground engagement. Moms Rising is active on the ground in one way or another in all 50 states. Some states have local steering committees and are more active and then sometimes they'll just do one-off events. Two summers ago, our members joined in a giant march through the streets of Detroit to protest the water shutoffs and joined our local partners as well as actor Mark Ruffalo in advocating for the basic human right of water but we know water and lead contamination concerns are not just in Michigan. We've joined local round tables and petition deliveries in Washington State, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere. The fifth layer, and this is the layer that I think is most important and we've been talking a lot about today, is our stories. The stories our moms tell are powerful ways to open up the eyes of leaders in the media and let our members know that they aren't, they aren't alone. We're known for our stories and the ways that we share them. Our members have spoken out around the country on how lead contamination has affected them, and I just want to share two of the stories today. The first is from Tony from Chicago, who wrote us saying, my daughter has lead in her system when she was a year old. I use natural remedies to leach it out of her system, but she still has trouble regulating her emotions at seven years old. How much of her life will be negatively impacted, impacted by lead, we won't know. Lead has no purpose in our water or air, so we should just get rid of it. And Betsy from Tacoma, Washington said, my home has been flagged as one of those possibly impacted by lead contamination in Tacoma. I have a 70 year old son and a new baby. I drank that water throughout my entire pregnancy with no knowledge that I could be harming my developing child. This isn't something that can be taken back. We need supports, not just for infrastructure and testing, but for what comes next for these children exposed to lead. Betsy's story was so powerful that she was invited to share it at a roundtable discussion with Senator Murray, um, and she was also interviewed by the media, and we've been able to take these stories and 
turn it into a million different activities for our members. The sixth layer is traditional new media. We involve the traditional media in everything we do, but we also are our own media outlet and with over 2,000 bloggers, a radio program, and a combined blogging and social media reach of over five million readers. For those of you that are not online, it is the new forefront for organizing. We also translate everything on our Spanish site, Mamas Con Poder. We have multiple tweet chats and Twitter storms on the topics of Flint water crisis, the Detroit water crisis, and lead poisoning as it relates to health, early learning, and the immigrant and faith communities. We're even co-hosting a Twitter storm this Tuesday at 3.30. For those of you that want to join in, you could use hashtag no more lead. We'd love for you to join in. We're going to be advocating for um, Congress to pass the emergency funding for Flint by the end of the year. And the seventh layer is cultivating legislative champions. At Moms Rising, we know we're working to advocate on many policies at the same time, so we know that a simple thank you goes a long way, and we always work to cultivate and educate legislative champions. We've worked closely in the past few months with key members of Congress, especially Senator Stabenow and Peters, in efforts to push for emergency funding and we plan to keep up the effort moving forward. This work on lead and water justice matters to our moms. We hear from them through all our various layers and we're committed to continuing the fight for various, for, to keep our homes, families, schools, and communities lead free and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear uh, one more time for our panel. Let's hear one more time for, for uh, Ruth Ann, which is really yeah. the <laughs> All right, look, we've got a, just a bit shy of 15 minutes, but this is why I was trying to rush us through. I want to make sure we have time for a real back and forth. So if you have a question or a statement, please raise your hand, and we'll get this started. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Governor, looking at the administration and the interest in uh, investment, or excuse me, infrastructure yep. funding. Can you help us frame the issue of abating lead issues in the water as an infrastructure that doesn't have the airport highway <laughs> yeah. uh, impression? The issue of infrastructure, stimulus, Keynesian stimulus and all that, lost a little bit of fuel because of what occurred a few years ago when it really wasn't stimulus. It was spent $1.2 trillion. And the Sherman Meridian jobs weren't there. And so um, I find, though, we were just, Senator, just actually whispering about some potential early wins. This would be a big early win, a bipartisan early win, but a big win for the country. But it, it's a lot of moving parts with regard to infrastructure. There's a lot of interest in, in tax reform. There's a bipartisan desire to lower the corporate income tax. There's a bipartisan desire to repatriate the dollars that are now offshore because of our, our, our dumb tax code. Um, in the past, you couldn't get tax reform done because the Republicans said no net increase in taxes, the Democrats said we want taxes. We all know, but the entire country said, but our tax code is really broken. The repatriated dollars obviously could, could really be, and I think uh, Senator Schumer, maybe in a position to actually cut a deal with regard to tax reform, infrastructure, cutting corporate income tax, and like really getting something really big done early to have dollars available for infrastructure improvement. This, in my view, is a logical extension of infrastructure improvement. So um, I'm giving my opinion, but I also think some of the pieces, mainly the pieces are there to actually get something big done early. The political lesson here, unfortunately, is big things get done in D.C. these days typically only when one party controls everything. President Obama got Obamacare and he got stimulus done because he controlled all three. House, Senate, President. Um, this is something that feeds Republicans philosophical leanings, Democrats philosophical leanings, and helps the country. Wow. What, what a thought. And so I think that your point is very well taken. It's possible. The case can be made. And we'll see. 
we'll see how this goes, but I think your point is well taken, and I think it's not lost on the incoming administration. Thank you. Thoughts, questions? I know it's Sunday night. Alex. Uh, I had a question for Michael. You were talking about the rental units as being an important focus for yeah. our efforts. Uh, I guess I wanted to ask you also about even a specific target within rental units. Mm -hmm. um, when I was running the National Center for Healthy Housing, the idea of ones and twos came up all the time. Yeah. And so um, yeah. tell me a little bit about your thoughts about whether we should be on the you know big multifamily properties or whether we should be looking at these kind of duplex properties, the ones and twos. So that was Rebecca Morley from Pew who asked that question. Yeah. Uh, Great question. Of the 40 million uh, occupied rental units, Rebecca's about split even between those with less than five units and those above five units. Uh, I think the question really begs whether or not, in most of the older buildings we're talking about, are in fact ones and twos. The real question is whether you can educate those landlords about figuring out a way for them to do this work and not have to come out of their pocket at $1,000 a unit or five, whatever it is. Uh, Governor Ehrlich and I were talking uh, before we came on, under his administration, the state of Maryland and other states are now providing uh, incentives to owners of such buildings to be able to do that work. Because we don't want the tenants evicted, obviously. We just talked about that. And we want to make sure the landlords, who are now spending in these older buildings, probably upper, upwards of 20% of their income on repairs, to figure out th that they won't do it because it's too expensive. So. I think, it, I think to do that, you really need a campaign, an educational campaign at the local level, probably with realtors and others, because that's who those small moms and pops really deal with. Uh, you know, for owners like us who own you know, thousands of units, it's really not, we, we got it. I mean, we, you know, we got you when you said hello. The real question is how can we figure out a way to pay for it and make sure the kids are safe? And that's something that I think needs a targeted campaign along the lines of the, of the governor was referring to at a national level. contract, it basically states that the landlord is removed from responsibility that any home maintenance has to be done by the tenant. Right. And so they don't have the money and the landlord isn't going to do anything. And it's actually a very common problem these days. Where are you from? Kansas City. Oh, hi. Hey. Is that <laughs> for me? Is that for me? Or for uh, anybody who wants to answer. <laughs> so... Not unlike the last question, I think it, it really requires, if it, required, it may require a change in law, I don't know. Kansas City, Missouri? It, it happens across the size rather than the market region. Um, okay, so. It's across the country. Yeah, so I think, but I don't know that you're going to get a national legislation. I really, I don't think, even though we're in Washington, D.C., I always think that the, the, a direct correlation between your distance from Washington and your belief that Washington do something for you. I mean, I, I really think it's important that local, local and states have a lot of con, uh, control over these issues. And it seems to me like that could be a targeted campaign that could be directed with not a lot of resources to try to make sure that those residents are able to eradicate that land. And I'm not suggesting it's easy or anything like that. But, but, okay, but let's move on to another yeah, I, I, right. Well, you, you know, we have a question up here on Slido.com from uh, Jamal Lewis. It actually, I think, just popped off the screen. But he is asking, what can be done uh, to actually uh, encourage property ma uh, property ma managers and landlords, owners, to actually get rid of the lead exposure in their properties? And that's in some ways where, where this question goes. So it's, a, so it's a carrot and stick, right? I mean. The stick is the law. Stick the, is stick, the, law. the stick is the law. But there has to be some kind of carrot that allows owners to not go into bankruptcy to do this. And they, they, as I mentioned, many owners, including us, are doing it. There are resources out there. But the education hasn't been done, I don't think, adequately 
nor are the resources available everywhere. And so I think that's, I really don't think there's that many owners who wouldn't want to try to do this if they were understood, number one, the impact on their residents, and number two, that there are resources to help them. I'll tell you what we did. Um, we believed in sticks too, but we denied them access to rent court until they got their yeah. properties in shape. Yeah. It's amazing to get everybody's attention to that dollar. <laughs> or registering, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, do we have more questions? Ben, there's, there's a question for uh, Dr. Wen about what, are the, what do you think the key components are of the Children's Health Program that includes lead but isn't just limited to lead? That's great. I love having a blank slate to, 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 um, to, to, to work with. You know, the, um, the ultimate question that we have to address, I think there are two parts. The first part, the very basic part, is addressing the fact that where our children happen to live should not determine whether they live. That's what I think should, is our premise that we have to start from, right? That we don't want that inequality to exist. I think there needs to be another component too, and I think Wes described this very well. That's kind of the basic level. Living, survival, is like your very basic level, but what, what, can we, what else can we do? Moms, I don't think, are, just have one expectation that their children won't die, there's something else too. And so what are those components? So I'd say starting from birth, it would be providing every resource necessary for that mom and for that child. Um, specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. In, in Baltimore, I chair a state mandated committee called the Child Fatality Review Committee. And this committee meets every month and we review every case of children who died in our city. And it's the worst two hours of my life every month. I mean, it's, I, it's extremely important work, but I, I dread going there because I know that we're viewing cases of children who died. And nearly all the cases are preventable. And actually, we have all the different agencies, city and state, sitting around the table. We have police and schools and social services and housing and so forth. And in almost every case, there is a file on that child this thick from every agency. And there's a file this thick for that child for their parents. And I think that the answer to this has to begin with what are all the components that we need in order to break, in order to break that cycle. And so it'll be social services, it'll be home visiting for pregnant moms, it'll be lead abatement so that our children are not canaries in a coal mine, right? That right now, how we detect lead, uh, the need for lead abatement in homes is children test positive. But that means that they could already be victims of acute poisoning and have kidney failure or seizures, or they could have chronic illnesses that then lead to permanent damage in their brains. And so how can we configure our system so that from the very, from the very beginning, from conception and looking at this life course approach, can we really break that cycle? Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Two minutes left, are there any questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, man, we're right in front of you. Hey, thank you very much. This is super illuminating and super interesting. And I was wondering, and Mr. Burkhardt, you mentioned that a lot is this thick, and I was wondering if there's enough enforcement of the law. And to Dr. Wen, I was wondering if there's a role for physician and public health officials in primary enforcement and not only tissue enforcement, when some would argue that a lot of damage has already been done. Thanks, Edward. So, uh, to answer very quickly the first question, is all of our, in every state now, where you're going after what are called low-income housing tax credits and you're buying a property that has lead in it, you have to eradicate the lead. Um, you won't be able to get an investor. You won't be able to get a syndicator. You won't be able to get insurance. You just won't be able to buy that property. Now, that doesn't deal with the people who are not developing, which was the question was earlier. But in fact, it's about 100,000 units a year are going through that system, and that system is working. And it's because it's requ required many owners have to do it. So the answer to, to your question is yes. <laughs> I do absolutely believe that physicians have a critical role to play in this, and we do. I mean, every major physician organization, every pediatrician that I've ever met will absolutely agree that this is a public health crisis and that we have to play a role. But I would add that it's not just physicians. Um, we have found that some of our best, um, our best messengers, our trusted messengers, are our community health workers our community members, our moms and dads and family members, 
um, we strongly believe that people are not problems to deal with, that they need to be part of every solution. Well, thank you. With that, I'm going to ask our panel just for our kind of final word of thought, and we'll start with Ms. Schmier, and we'll work this way. Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, we're here as a resource to you in your communities. We want to work with you if you need the voices of moms, which are some of the most important voices, as Dr. said. You know, it, Flint was, the whistle was blown on Flint primarily by a mother, and she took the information that she was given the national news and to universities to make sure that no and to be quiet was no longer the answer. And that's kind of what moves a lot of our moms. So we're here to work with all of you. We know that this is a crisis across the country and we just want to be a resource and a partner to make sure that in five years we don't have to have another panel like this. Along those same lines, if I saw a patient in the ER who has many things going on, Maybe they have cancer, maybe they have heart disease, maybe they have you know, whatever other illness, maybe they want a car accident. It's never an option to say, let somebody else deal with this person. Let me have the oncologist first and then the cardiologist first, right? We all have a role to play in this. And so I, I strongly believe that this is, an, this is an issue, this is a problem with solutions and that no matter who we are and what sector we're in, we need to be part of it. So I come out of the affordable housing sector and there is a true rental crisis going on in the nation, a, a crisis that I don't think I will live to see solved. But this crisis, the crisis that you're involved in, is something that can be tackled. It is something that can be solved. We know wh where these buildings are. We know where the kids are living in these buildings. There's, there has to be a way to target these units in my lifetime. And I'd love to see all of us gathered here in five years and congratulate ourselves to a job well done. Yeah, I want to put Ruth Hannah out of business. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of that. And we want to put all y'all out. You know, look, as we wrap up here, I want to leave you with the thoughts of, Dar of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, and this is an apocryphal quote handed down by several of the men who worked with him. He said once, if you're comfortable in your co- uh, in your co- uh, listen, then your co- uh, listen is too small. And I want to ask you if you feel comfortable in this room tonight. You know, the, uh, and I suspect that you do. The founder of uh, the Freedom Singers in Mississippi uh, said once, coalition is not family. Coalition is a dangerous place, but it's an important place. And so as you go home to your states, ask yourself that question. Get your team in a room and say, is this comfortable? Can we be bigger? Can we be more effective? Can we, you know, who do we need to actually get this done? Because Lord knows none of us in this room are advocates because we want to advocate on this issue forever. We're advocates on this issue because we want to get it done. And you can do it. And so go home and build the coalition, the dangerous, uncomfortable, large, broad, but urgent and fierce coalition to get it done. We can win this. Let's do it. God bless.